Um, I lead the file system uh, development, so whatever terminology, they may be highly skewed towards the file system world. Mm -hmm. I'll try to make it a little more generic whenever it's possible. So um, just putting the objective for the architecture for the file system, what are the key objectives we have and how do we align um, software development according to that? We want to build our products on volume components, volume hardware, which is available easily. It provides a scale and quality. And access choice. We don't want to put restriction on the customer what access choice they will have. It's the customer who decides whatever way they want to access. They can use FC, SCSI, NFS, SMB, in future, anything, RDMA, NVMe or Fabric, or S3. It, 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 it's their choice. Third point is, uh, as it provides a platform where you can serve multiple types of workload, and what we have been observing, there's an increasing mix of uh, workload which has different kind of requirements. So there may be some requires very high um, random IOPS, some requires very high sequential writes. So it depends, and, and low latency, of course, for databases and analytics and all that. So how do we map all those things in, in the file system software so that we uh, provide all those things uh, nicely? Uh, it maps into f um, a, f a few more things like provide all the um, volume components and all. Plus, we are also aware NVMe uh, today is one technology. There may be another technology like low, land, um, low latency NAND tomorrow. Could be first class memory. So we uh, still want to have a separation that we can adopt to any kind of media or multiple media types in the architecture very smoothly. So I'm just going to uh, give um, a little bit of a flow. How does the right uh, path comes into our system? And then I'll go into details why um, we chose the platform, what kind of platform, and limitations of the volume components which you have right now. So um, any protocol, first it comes to in-memory transaction system, and then we, we need to um, persist this data in uh, some faster media. So in, this, in NVMe platform, we use NVDIM. Even in SAS platform, we use uh, NVDIM. We had hybrid system where we had combination where you can have NVDIM or non-NVDIM, it doesn't matter. And then it needs to be uh, sent to the other side with uh, HA controller system. So it provides you the recovery guarantee in times of crashes. And only when it is written to the other side, it's acknowledged back to the client that this is run. So from the latency perspective, this is the whole thing which is impacting the latency if everything we can write to the drives fast enough, which means if I have a fast enough uh, NVMe drive or in drive, if it remains fast enough, the latency from any application is actually dependent upon this one for the right perspective. And read is, is actually dependent upon caching and how fast is the media and a bunch of other things. So before I go uh, more details into the um, various things, I just want to uh, touch upon why did we choose NVDIM uh, and also why did we choose NVDIM and where it is. So there were two options when we uh, picked up the platform, put the NVDIM or memory-like device in the storage bay itself, or use our continuing technology, which we had on the SAS one. There were some limitations in the volume component which you had. You have a total of 48 PCI lanes, and there are PCI 3, which means there are two restrictions. Number of lanes are limited, and their performance is limited. So, in our product, we have 24 drives, which means if we need to support 24 drives dual ported, and each drive has performance in excess of 2 GB per second, which means we need to give at least two lanes to give it a chance that it can provide the performance from the hardware perspective. So that forced us um, to not choose the storage bay because it would mean uh, waste at least four, five, six slots just for the NVDIM, <coughs> and you're losing on the capacity. So we use NVDIM in um, the existing model which we had, which is NTB-based mirroring. And that is, in the first generation platform, is still PCI 8-based, eight, uh, 8 lanes, but it's still fast enough. We can get 5 GB per second from the application perspective, both sides. So effectively, 10 gigabyte per second uh, right through for performance on that one. So that provided us a good boost in uh, capacity and the performance at the same time. Now coming to the actual file system work, uh, what we had to do to leverage the performance um, from that. So I'm, uh, the file system uh, is logically uh, in three 
layers, I can say. One is the physical device consumption. So the <coughs> way we um, consume the device is different. And we will uh, explore that one uh, in little detail. I'm going to talk mainly on the namespace layer, because that's where the file system work, all the things are done, deduplication, compression, um, uh, applying the data, indexing, and all that. So that's where uh, things are important. One, there are four key points in this. How do you um, um, leverage the performance range of NVMe devices? Um, they have so much capabilities, and there's no hardware which can even match those capabilities. So how do we even try to make a merge where it can exploit some of the performance which is possible from the underlying devices? So first idea was, okay, utilize the instruction sets of the newer technologies, uh, CPU, Skylake SP or that. So AVX 512, um, double register, so everywhere, wherever possible, like computation of the rate PQ parities, uh, compression, or um, even the multi-hashing we implement a different way. So you utilize the CPU, whatever CPU provides, that gives you benefit in that you can leverage it. Second, we used more cores. Um, that's a, theoretically it should provide more concurrency, but file system software, it doesn't work as concurrency in the CPU is increasing because there are some global logs, there are some consistency requirements. So the maximum works, and there are several patent pending things we have filed in this area. How do we make the file system software in such a way that it remains highly concurrent, which means as the course increase, we can leverage more and more work without uh, getting limited by the inter-CPU contents and all that. So um, the two aspects in that one also, one, there are some algorithms and some data structures that do not work as you scale. So we had to rewrite some of them to match which it scales. For example, page cache buff uh, buffering, we completely moved away from any locking model to complete lockless model. Even the task you dispatch at that high rate doesn't work that good enough even you have a small lock somewhere. So we had to make that even as completely lockless. And even at the queue level, when, when we are submitting the IOs, because the number of IOs or requests are so high, including the metadata and data, it cannot scale if you have any lock anywhere. So completely made the lockless layer in the queues. So if you think about our virtual device layer, at this point, we don't have any concurrency bottleneck, which means this layer is fully concurrent. Anything you can give, it works independently. It's like a, whatever work you give, it will give you back, and you can use it, the namespace layer to drive whatever you can. Third angle was, in the file system mechanism, can we do something which can allow me to go more concurrent and do more work? So in that, um, basically, we um, also exp wanted to exploit the benefits of the storage media. Um, random performance is great in any SSD device, but if you notice, the sequential bandwidth is even better. So if you have anything random, if you can convert all of them into uh, becoming a fully sequential workload and bigger and bigger in size, all the numbers quoted on SSD drive, they say uh, 2 GB uh, write per second, but that's 128 kilobyte. File system application doesn't generate all the time those kind of uh, workloads. So how do I create that environment in the namespace layer, which basically does only large IOs? So we changed our algorithms and everything so that it always generates all the writes in uh, big chunks, everything. So read is read, whatever size it gets, you have to serve that, but at least in write side, in background operation, in rebuild operation, everything you can make any random operation into fully sequential. So now that gives us advantage. You can utilize the sequential bandwidth of the re, uh, read performance and write it out in that. So one of the aspect was in say, uh, free processing. It's a copy. Yeah. Well, just a quick question. So if you uh, convert to sequential, does that reduce the write amplification also? So you get better endurance? If yes, on it. that's right. Thanks. So um, on the read, uh, free processing, uh, as you know, we are copy and write file system, which means we can be as fast as we can do the free processing. So if you want to write very fast, you need to be able to free also very fast. So we, re we rewrote our uh, free processing system completely. And then uh, uh, I can just give an example. When we did that software, same hardware, zero change, we were able to double 
our write performance, both random and sequential, 2x at, at lower 60% lower latency, just by doing the mechanism. What it allows, it cut down the number of events, number of allocations you are doing, number of IOs which you are dispatching, number of times you need to contend, it reduces by two order of magnitudes. So if, you, if I'm doing 100 things earlier, that mechanism allowed me to do just one, and that is scales performance. Very <coughs> nice win. I think, the, I think the data integrity uh, in this model is, is what I found to be the most compelling piece. So um, from data integrity, we are continuing whatever we uh, had. We did not compromise anything. We did change some mechanisms, but we made sure the data integrity remains at the same level. Exactly. So Shalendra, can I ask a question yep. on the hardware side? Um, do you use Intel today? Yes. So would you not see a lot of benefit going down the route of, say, AMD Epic, when you get more PCI lanes and you get more cores and you have more bandwidth? Would that, would that not be an architectural benefit for you rather than staying on the Intel platform? Um, actually, that's a good point. I'll come to that last slide in our next generation, next generation platform. So we'll, we'll probably talk in that one. Okay. Yeah. So coming back to the virtual device layer, um, so NVMe provides me um, very good capability in adopting the storage media as per your need. They call it namespace, but truly it's, uh, it's like a um, virtual device which you can map and say, I want to do random IO on this particular device. It's the same storage, but you can now tune your one part of the device to do random IO, another part to do sequential IO, another part to do uh, something else. So, and this actually matches with our um, continuing work, which we already had in our architecture even before NVMe came in. We always, always had classes of uh, um, uh, IOs, which is log class or anything which is sequential. So if you want something very fast, we'll put always in the sequential class, which means it's just starting from one point, keep going until, and just rotate. So it doesn't do anything else. And then we had metadata. Um, which is fully random. So everything, whatever you do is, is uh, you know, you have no prediction. And same thing for um, uh, hard data and sequential light. So how we are leveraging, now these classes can directly be mapped onto the NVMe namespaces as is. We don't need to do anything. So we just need to map those in our virtual device layer and do that. This is the first step. We can go even further. In the application level, I can create some of those tagging, and I can pass it down to underlying namespace layer. So that means starting from the application, LAN or VM, whatever, that can flow right into the namespace, and it can customize the behavior of the media as the need of the application. So um, in, in just, it gives me a um, little more opportunity because now we are vertically integrated. Um, SSD media also has some sort of garbage collection, and file system also has a garbage collection. But we have also made everything sequential from right perspective. Now, what that means, I can do coordinated garbage collection, which means we can talk to each other and say, you don't need to do the garbage collection I need to tell you. I know where you need to do the garbage collection. What it gives me, the poor provisioning in SSD is, in future, we can reduce from fixed percentage to whatever we want at will. So let's say today is 30% or 35%, whatever, some number, I don't know, exact number. I can reduce based upon my workload to 5%, 10%, so whatever. Why does, why does mapping different N NVMe namespaces to different, but does it provide any different performance characteristics? Let's say one namespace is random and the other one is sequential. Why does that provide, I mean, why is, what's the advantage there? From from a from a Intel Flash perspective. Okay, so um, let's say if it is random, uh, the churn rate is very high. For the so that for means, the for the write buffer or for the yeah, right for right. So, so it's it's changing very fast, which means that will have uh, that needs um, basically uh, DPWD higher. It needs it will. But isn't uh, isn't that garbage collection at a, at a at a device level, not at the namespace level? No, we have garbage collection at namespace level also. Ah. Okay. So we can we can control. So that, what that uh, provides me, I can control the namespace. Uh, sorry, device level garbage collection because I know if I'm going to do something, it may affect the latency. So that provides me a full control over the latency, both in read and write path. So you, okay. 
So bear, bear in mind so, you own the devices, the hardware. Yeah. Oh, uh, this is just a quickie. Is that that uh, thing where you say namespaces to match unique I/O accesses? That's the same as streams in an SSD, isn't it? Um, uh, yes, you can say logically it's a similar concept. So I was just going to say, bear in mind you know you own the, you own the hardware, as in the guys that just presented were presenting about the drives. So you know how garbage collection sure. works. That's right. that's exactly. Um, we are trying. I'm assuming to you can so, so you influence can that directly then. Yes. Um, yes, I mean, uh, right, uh, even T10 is coming up with some of those uh, things which we are doing right now as uh, in form of a standards, but we can do far more because we are integrated. So okay. we can leverage some of the things which is not possible outside. So, I mean, for garbage collection and that sort of thing, you've got excess capacity, which is reserved for, you know, white buffers and stuff like this. So you can partition that excess capacity on a namespace basis. We can, we can change, so let's say we have some pool of uh, over-provisioning. I don't need to attach to any namespace unless I need to. And I can dynamically attach that over-provisioning to a particular namespace if I want. Oh. And on the requirements, I'm noticing your specific hints. Is the system doing any automated learning on the back end about the workloads that are coming in to adjust the configuration as, as a result? Uh, I will say yes and no both. We do some, but it's not enough. Okay. So at system level, we are still um, limited in our predictable. Some things are obvious, whether it's random, sequential, um, big block or small block. That is easier. But there are times when applications change their behavior. They are perfectly random for 24, uh, 23 hours a day, and suddenly they become sequential, read sequential right in the night. They are doing some uh, backup or something like that. So for that, we, what we are doing, there's an additional product line um, software, IntelliCare, what we are taking help of IntelliCare, analyze those patterns. How do you see that behavior of an application? Right now we are doing at the system level, not at the application level, uh, but in future we should be able to do at the application level also by leveraging that work. And that we will use in future to learn more about the application. That will give us much more uh, advantage because we will have more history we will see that pattern changes in light, night, 11 o'clock, there's something else in daytime. So we can adopt based upon that. But right now, uh, we are still in learning phase in the IntelliCare. Right. We, are, we are capturing the data, we still have, you can view it, but we are not yet feeding into the file system. Feeding back directly, yeah. So, um, and what it boils down to, that we can provide low latency, high IOPS, high throughput, applications and they map to any any kind of those workloads and as the workloads are increasing uh, increasingly mixed they will be sometimes random sometimes sequential so it's very hard to isolate them which one is superior so which means we need to work on all three dimensions at the same time we don't have like to say we will optimize only sequential read or write will optimize only latency we need to provide all mix uh, and it matches with the data center consolidation story because more and more Different kind of applications are being moved to the same system, so it, it aligns very well. Calendar, you didn't mention anything about NVMe or Fabric. I'm Coming up later. right here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, oh. Nice lead in, Ray. Lead in. And, and you didn't say anything about storage class memory as, as a replacement for NVDev. It, it's, it's the second line here and the first line. <laughs> <laughs> right. Nice yes. try. Perfect. So, um, as we talked, we do not have one controller or two controller system which can derive the maximum benefit of a NVMe drive. At least I don't see in next two, three years also that we will be able to get any kind of system which can drive the whole performance range of NVMe. So what we need to do then, that means the current controller model is potentially not going to work. It will be very good choice for say, some sort of application who have a much smaller footprint around. How do I, make it go in independent uh, domain, which is you scale the compute on your own and you scale the storage on your own and you add the infrastructure to provide that. So which means top layer you can um, scale as many nodes you want and bottom layer and NVMe or Fabric provides us the perfect opportunity to do that. Yes. I don't know if it's part of this talk or not, but one of the things I found very interesting with the um, IntelliFlex was that you actually had a hard disk drive, uh, a hard disk drive box that had NVMe out, uh, output from it. 
I a disk drive? I will let Narayan answer that. The, a disk yeah. drive box. A J bot. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So, Tom, let me, am I on? Was that also re-anticipating future? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, but that, that's a brilliant question because yeah. part of our design, and if you go back in history of the company, right, so, or we were Teja, got acquired in, right, um, it, was a, it was a model that supported multiple different media types, right? Which is, we use flash, one was SLC, and then we use hard drives. So the architecture essentially supports that. And in fact, now that we've introduced NVMe, right? We have a number of customers who are basically asking exactly that, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, on the one hand, we've gone to the other extreme that says, we start with NVMe, you can add SAS flash. Mm -hmm. And then our customers says, That's, we love it, but we want NVMe, and can we use yeah. Then storage. That's your fabric, yeah. Yeah, and, and so we're doing that as well. So we have a number of customers who take advantage of it. So the, the interesting dynamic in this is, well, as much as we thought that, hey, you know, we're going all NVMe, we'll follow it up with the expansion of SAS Flash. That's great. That works. Uh, because the NVMe, uh, you know, uh, JBOF ecosystem is still evolving, right? And I know uh, Scott's going to talk about it in more detail. But, but to your point exactly, which is we have a lot of customers who are asking for exactly that, which is the ability to scale performance, mm -hmm. at the same time, scale economics. So. Thanks. Right. So um, on the first point, I said we want to go to a model where we can independently uh, scale compute and storage. Um, there are challenges in that one. Uh, what kind of switching infrastructure will be there? There are limitations on the switch. Uh, which are available, and even bigger is a PCI um, lane performance and all that. So we're waiting a few more um, hardware innovations, PCI Gen 4, PCI Gen 5, which will give us more and more bandwidth, which we can leverage. And coming back to our um, media types, as, uh, as I uh, talked earlier, we believe that there will be more media type innovations in the next four or five years in different ways. Uh, so we are still conscious of that fact, and we are going to build our system to exploit that. So one is QLC NAND, which is probably going to appear very soon um, uh, in our product portfolio, maybe this year or next year. Uh, that will provide us a capacity, which will be seamless um, move into our hybrid storage model where you have metadata and uh, storage, sequential rights and all that in the faster uh, NVMe kind of things. and. Uh, slightly colder data in the QLC NAND kind of model. And then low latency um, NAND or a storage class memory, we will definitely start exploiting either in read intensive applications. It could be um, um, analytics workload or whatever. And they can be accessed through RDMA protocol from the client. So it will allow us also to offload some of the computational work to the clients if they are doing that, providing even better latency. Now. From the file system perspective, what are the things which we see we can leverage from the vertical integration at the device level? There are a lot of things we can offload to the devices, and that will give us a lot of boost in, in several things. For example, uh, when I need to do a move of data from one location to another, today I'm just reading and writing it out again, which I don't need to do it. If I'm reading and writing out the same device, I can pass a vector to the underlying device, and it can read and write whenever it feels and we can work through it. That will solve latency problem, whatever we have, and manage even uh, when, whenever there's a background operations running, there are some times we are not able to uh, right. manage right. latency to Are you suit. talking about putting the computation in the SSDs or at the controller level, or where, where's the competition, computation taking um, place? So, okay. so um, uh, the second one competition, let's, let's say, uh, mainly we see in the rebuild, let's say there's a device failure, and I want to rebuild the data on a missing um, Track comp drives. Yeah. That computation we can offload to the device because it has equivalent processing technology. For example, encryption is already supported. Those controllers can handle that kind of instruction sets and that kind of computation. So I can pass a vector saying these are the devices which are affected by this, and this is the column which you need to populate and use the math, which is pretty standard, uh, math, PQ, uh, and they can use it. Uh, they can use it to uh, uh, write it out. And actually that, I think, will be an even bigger differentiator because the size of the devices are increasing. 60 ten, 16 terabyte today, it will be 64 terabyte in just one year, probably in the end of the next year. How do you even rebuild that kind of system unless you leverage uh, all the potential underneath? So that will allow us to move a lot of um, rebuild-related work, copy-related work to underlying devices, freeing up 
file system software to do the nice things uh, on the top.